In our next set of videos, we're going to take a deeper look into the structure of groups by first looking at the normal subgroups of a group. Not just any old subgroups, but those whose cosets from the left are the same as their cosets from the right. Then we'll talk about quotient groups, in which we take a group and one of its normal subgroups and we kind of forget about the normal subgroup. We treat it all like it's a single element and look at the cosets of that group as a group itself. We get what's called a quotient group. And finally, we're going to look at the concept of a solvable group. What does it mean for a group to be solvable? This is probably new. It's something you might not have seen in Abstract Algebra 1. And it's going to be very important to our course this semester. So what is a solvable group, and what does it have to do with the normal subgroups of a group? So three topics to cover. First of all, what is a normal subgroup of a group? What is a quotient of a group by one of its normal subgroups? And what does it mean for a group to be solvable? Let's get started with topic number one, normal subgroups. The motivation behind this is we'd like to see what it's going to take for us to be able to treat the cosets of a subgroup inside of a group as though they were elements in and of themselves. In other words, instead of doing arithmetic with the individual elements of a group, do arithmetic with the cosets of a subgroup within that group. And what we really need is we need for the product of two cosets to be a coset in and of itself, so that if we think of the cosets like elements, we have closure under the operation in the group. So here's a quick example of what we're about to talk about. Suppose I have the set 0, 3, 6, and 9 inside of Z mod 12. We've seen that that is an example of a subgroup, so H is a subgroup of Z12. The cosets associated with the subgroup are found by just adding 1, 2, and maybe 3 to this group. But we find out if we add 3 to H, we end up getting the same thing as H itself. So really, there are just three cosets. H is an index 3 subgroup of Z mod 12. So the question is, can we treat these cosets as though they were elements, doing arithmetic with the cosets instead of with the individual elements? So can we make these three elements into a group somehow? That's the question that we're about to answer. So the first thing we need is to think of a certain kind of subgroup of a group that we're going to call the normal subgroups. Normal subgroups are a way of resolving this left versus right coset tension. We saw in a previous video that there are always as many left cosets as there are right cosets for a given subgroup, but that those cosets need not always be the same as one another. Well, if the subgroup H is normal, by definition, those cosets are the same. Left, right, left coset and right coset for a given element are indeed the same thing. Another way of saying that is that if I uh, multiply any element of the subgroup by the inverse of G on one side and G itself on the other side, that I get another element of that subgroup H. So if H belongs to my subgroup big H, then its conjugation by the element G also belongs in H. And associated with this definition, we also have the idea of a simple group. What does it mean for a group to be simple? Somehow this is a notion of being indivisible. That a group is simple if it doesn't have any normal subgroups inside of it except for the two examples that always work. Namely, the trivial subgroup is always a normal subgroup. And of course, the whole group itself is also a normal subgroup of itself. And when those are the only two examples of normal subgroups, then we call the group simple. So let's look at some examples. Going back to Z mod 12 again. Let's take the subgroup which consists of the even integers, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. Is this a normal subgroup of Z mod 12? Well, to find out, let's first of all remember that the operation in Z mod 12 is addition modulo 12. So when we say GH, what we really mean is we're going to take a group element G and add it to every element in this, co in this subgroup H to get a coset, modulo 12, of course. So what does G plus H look like? Well, it looks like G plus 0, G plus 2, G plus 4, and so on up to G plus 10. What about adding g on the other side? Well, that's 0 plus g, 2 plus g, and so forth. And naturally, because the addition of two integers modulo 12 is a commutative operation, these two cosets are always exactly the same for a given element g. So because this operation was commutative, the left cosets and the right cosets were, of course, the same thing. That generalizes to the statement that we can conclude that any abelian group, any group in which the operation is commutative, every one of its subgroups is a normal subgroup. So normal is really only an interesting concept in groups that aren't abelian, because in an abelian group, normal subgroups are the same as subgroups. Let's look at Z mod 5 for a second, just changing the game a little bit. What are the normal subgroups of Z mod 5? Well, we always have the trivial subgroup, and we always have the whole group itself. Again, every group is a normal subgroup of itself. But now let's suppose that I want something in the middle. Suppose I want a subgroup that contains 0 and 1. Well, if 1 belongs to my subgroup, then every power of 1 also has to. In other words, the cyclic subgroup generated by 1 also has to belong to H. 
What is the cyclic subgroup generated by 1 in Z mod 5? Well, it contains 2, 1 plus 1. It contains 3, 1 plus 1 plus 1. 4, and then add 1 one more time, we get back to 0. So in fact, any subgroup of Z mod 5 that contains 1 has to be the entire group Z mod 5. Likewise with 2. Take a look at what the powers of 2 are in this group. 2 plus 2 is 4, plus 2 is 1, plus 2 is 3, plus 2 is 0. So in fact, the cyclic subgroup generated by 2 is all of Z mod 5 as well. Likewise with 3, 4, and, uh, well, 3 and 4. So in other words, 1, 2, 3, and 4, all of the non-identity elements of Z mod 5, generate the entire group Z mod 5. So in fact, there are no normal subgroups other than the trivial subgroup and the whole group itself. So Z mod 5 is in fact a simple group because it has no examples of non-trivial proper normal subgroups. All right, so let's look at some non-abelian examples already. Here's a subgroup we looked at on a previous uh, video. The subgroup consisting of the two transpositions, 1 and 2, and 3 and 4, and then also their product, 1, 2, 3, 4, inside of the symmetric group on four symbols. Is this a normal subgroup? Well, let's just try taking an element which doesn't belong to H, like 1, 3, and operating on H on the left. And then simplifying what we have using our cycle notation, we find out that the left coset of 1, 3 has these four elements in it. All right, what about the right coset of 1, 3? Again, multiply all these transpositions on the right by 1, 3, and simplify using cycle notation what we have. Here we get these four elements. So again, these two cosets have the same number of elements as one another, but the elements themselves are not the same. So the left coset of this element and the right coset of this element disagree one with another. So even though H is a subgroup of G, it's not a normal subgroup of G. Well, okay, can we fix this? Is there a subgroup that looks like H inside of the symmetric group on four symbols? And the answer turns out to be yes. Let's look at this subgroup that consists of the 2 plus 2 cycles, 1, 2, and 3, 4, 1, 3, and 2, 4, and 1, 4, and 2, 3, inside of the symmetric group on four symbols. You should check for yourself to make sure this actually is a subgroup, by the way. And to find out whether or not this is a, sub a normal subgroup, I'm going to need to make one observation about the symmetric group. And that observation is that if I take a transposition sigma, or really any element, sorry, in the symmetric group, and I conjugate it on both sides, so multiply by g inverse on the left and g on the right for some element g, it turns out that both of those elements are going to have the same cycle type. This is a fact about the symmetric group that's not too terribly difficult to prove, but we're not going to take the time to prove it right now. We are going to use this fact in just a moment, though, to show that, in fact, h is a normal subgroup in S4. So here's how it goes. First of all, this subgroup H actually contains all of the 2 plus 2 cycles that exist in the symmetric group on four symbols. So every 2 plus 2 cycle is here, represented in H. Meanwhile, if I take any element of S4 and some element inside of H, and I conjugate that element of H by my element from S4, then this fact tells me that that conjugated permutation has the same cycle type, 2 plus 2, as the original. But since H contained all of the cycles of type 2 plus 2, that means that this conjugate also has to belong to H. And because my sigma was arbitrary, that means that if I conjugate the entire subgroup H by any element G in S4, the result is H itself again. So indeed, H is a normal subgroup of S4.